Hello, my friends. Welcome to another edition of the Heritage Wealth Planning YouTube channel. That's my uh, funky fresh t-shirt there, heritagewealthplanning.com. I want to talk about today about a mutual fund that, uh, that I've followed for quite some time. And the risk that you have when you follow the trendsetters, all right? This fund is, uh, is you, you can't do that. You can't chase performance, my friends. You cannot chase performance unless you're going to tell yourself at threat of death that you're not going to get out of a fund no matter what. You just can't do it. I'm going to show you what I'm talking about here in just a second. Back in the, uh, after what's it, 2007 and eight. Uh, when the market is going crazy, everything was losing its shirt, everything except for uh, government bonds. Um, but at the end of the decade, there's the number one fund for the decade. The number one fund for the decade. There's basically two, but I'm going to talk about the one we're going to show you here in just a second in terms of performance. And that's a USA Gold and Precious Metals Fund. USA Gold and Precious Metals Fund. And I actually worked at USA at this time. Uh, USA did a lot to publicize it, uh, you know, because there's their best performers and they figured that if people wanted, my hair's a little bit messed up, sorry guys, they figured if people wanted a good mutual fund, they should buy this because it's the number one fund. They had all the marketing behind it, blah, 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 blah. Of course, that's exactly when you should not buy the fund when everyone's talking it up as if it's, uh, the previous performance are going to be future performance. Now they'll always say, not just USA, but all mutual fund companies, Past performance is not indicative of future performance. But here's all this literature about how great we are and we've been. But past performance is not indicative of future performance. But here's all this literature, how great we are. It's, it's such a... Uh. Anyway, so USAGX is a ticker. And I want to show it to you because I find it very, very interesting. Let me minimize myself here. I'm going to show you. Yeah, uh, this is from Business Wire, a Berkshire Hathaway company, by the way. Um, and so USA Precious Metals and Minerals Fund ranks as top performing fund of the decade. Uh, fund ranks highest among 39, 24 equity and fixed income funds with an average returns of 24.44% over two years. <laughs> Anyway, uh, USA Fortune 500 company but today announced that USA Precious Metals Fund. There we go. USA announced its own fund was ranked number one performing mutual fund of the decade. Talks about the uh, the managers. Here's Chris Claus, who's no longer with USA. Uh, he left in 2015, I believe. I'm not sure on his own or if he's kindly shown the door. Uh, my intuition is he might have been kindly shown the door, actually. Um Talk about the managers of PMs, portfolio managers. Mark Johnson and Dan Denbo standout performance over the past uh, decade clearly illustrates USA's focus on delivering positive results over the long term through all market environments, um, says Chris Claus. Having the best performing fund over the decade is a significant achievement for both portfolio managers, and we're proud to have the best in the business here at USAA. All right, so just remember these words here. Remember these words. Uh, the quarter end of year averages as of December 31st, 2009, which has an expense ratio of 1.31%, is 25.5% uh, over the five-year period, ranking fifth overall, but we already talked about that. All right, so let's see if there's any comments. No comments. But again, this is a USA press release because we see Melissa Schultz, who you can contact. Um, she's got a 212 area code, though. don't know why that is, and she's with Fleshman.com, uh, so I'm not sure if that's just a PR firm that USA was using to tout their investment prowess. I don't know. Um, so let's go up here now. Um, I'm going to share with you from uh, CBS News uh, why you should money watch, why you should avoid the decade's top fund. Now, this is from a different top fund, the CGM Focus Fund, which I'm going to share with you in just a second because um, they have a lot of similarities here. All right, so they updated this on January 10th, 2000, January 8th, 2010. When was this guy written? This was a uh, press release, January 25th, 2010. So these two funds are neck and neck, but I want to share with you the CBS Money Watch thing because it's incredibly, incredibly important for you to understand. Um, let me just move myself out of the way. All right, so I was pretty familiar with Ken Hebner before uh, this time because CGM Focus Fund has always been aggressive, always been a, gone against the mainstream, which means it's, it's probably going to outperform in the long run because it's contrarian. But let me read this to you. CGM Focus Fund has, a comp has completed an incredible decade. 
Uh, manager Kev Hebner has guided his fund to an amazing 17.9% annual return for the 10 years that ended in 2009, a record that places him first among all domestic equity fund managers. Okay, so the uh, the other fund, the Gold and Precious Metals, was all fund managers, the fixed income, commodity market, everything like that, just everything all encompassing. This fund is just domestic equity funds, all right? Uh, and that one uh, surpasses the, both the S&P 500 and the Russell 1000 growth by 20 percentage points annually. But should you add this fund to your portfolio? Better think twice about that. Why? For starters, Hebner's managerial style, style makes a six-year-old on Christmas morning look placid. <laughs> That's pretty good. Uh, since 2000, his fund has had an average turnover of 333%, meaning his portfolio has essentially changed every three to four months his entire portfolio. That sort of turnover can produce a boatload of tax liabilities. And I've talked about that in other episodes and I'll link to them right there. Um, uh, in fact, in 2007, CGM pr produced a capital gain distribution of $9.91 per share, almost 20% of the fund's assets. That's a significant capital gain if this was not in an IRA, which again goes back to my thing. Any fund that produces a lot of distributions, if it's an equity fund, stock fund, should be in your Roth. Any fund that produces a lot of distributions on the interest side should be in your traditional. All right. Uh, secondly, uh, CGM Focus has an incredibly concentrated portfolio, typically investing in fewer than 25 stocks. Now, my friends, you know, if you follow my channel, I believe in indexing 100%. 100% because indexing is all encompassing. The only way for a manager to beat the index is, is for there be a manager that's inferior to the index. The only way to, is what's called alpha. The only way to generate alpha, positive results relative to the index, if there's someone who has negative alpha. Okay, that means I take from you, that makes my performance better. You lose to me uh, in poker. It's a zero sum game. Someone wins and someone loses. That's the only way to do it. Historically, in fact, I would argue this going forward. The only way to beat the indices is to have a concentrated portfolio, making large bets on a few different firms. That's it. That's for active share. All right. Now, there's some debate on how prominent active share is, but I'm telling you right now, regardless of the exact amount of the debate on active share, the funds that are going to outperform are absolutely not closet indexers. That means they don't have 450 stocks relative to the 500 of the S&P 500. No, we want a high active share. That simply means they have a concentrated portfolio. The reason why that works is because if that concentrated portfolio happens across some good luck, you're going to make out like a bat, bat out of hell. That's just all there is to it. The counter of that, of course, is... If you're concentrated in large cap growth and tech stocks during 2000, you're going to be in a world of hurt. Small cap growth tech stocks in 2000, you're going to be in a world of hurt. Conversely, if you're concentrated in government bonds in 2008, you made a, a bundle. So it's all a matter of luck. If your concentrated portfolio happens on good times, you are a kingmaker. If your concentrated portfolio is happening on bad times, you're going to the dungeon. It is the only way for you to outperform is a concentrated portfolio of a select number of stocks, what's called high active share. Look up active share. There's a bunch of stuff on that. Some people take issue with it. Some people you know, live by it. I actually believe in it 100%, but it's not because of active share that makes a portfolio superior. It's because the active share that portfolio manager chose happened to have come across a streak of luck. There's no getting around that. And if they come across luck, they can absolutely do good things. If they come across bad luck, they can do bad things. I'll show you what I'm talking about here in just a second. Uh, so making large bets on a few different firms can pay off handsomely when Hebner is right, as in 2007, when the fund returned 80%. But the flip side is can also produce outside losses as evidenced by the 48% loss in 2008. Uh, yeah, that's not fair. Um, 2008, everything got hammered, not just Hebner. Uh, 2007, Hebner was up 80%. That was, again, that was attributed to his portfolio concentration. Uh, 2008 wasn't because of Hebner and his active shares, just everything got hammered. I mean, so that's, that, that's not, that's disingenuous. Um, the whipsawing performance is clearly evident in viewing the fund's year by year performance. In five of the past 10 years, CGM Focus has landed in the category's top quartile, and three years has been the bottom quartile. 
uh, stint in the, each of the two middle quartiles has rounded out the decade. It is a sort of up and down performance that led to fund alarms to compare Hebner to the little girl with a curl. Don't know what that is, but when he's good, he's real good. When he's bad, he's horrible. Uh, but given the facts, the fund's track record speak for itself. So why not pile in and hang on for the ride? And this is what's important because the evidence is overwhelming that no matter how much you convince yourself, you have the stomach for the roller coaster. Um, you ultimately do not. Now, he's talking, this guy, the writer of this article is talking specifically about Hebner. I think it's generally speaking on all these aggressive funds that are going up and down. Most people don't have the stomach for it. They just don't. They can convince themselves they do. I just, I truly believe they don't. Now, if this is your if you have a core and explore, so your core part of your portfolio is just geared towards the indices, um, and then you have an explore part, say 20% of your portfolio is geared towards a fund like this, a concentrated fund, you're probably more inclined to be able to ride out the, the ups and downs for sure. But if your core is minimal and your explore is maximal, um, where you have 80% in a fund like this because you think you need to make up for lost time, or you think you know, a little bird told you that you know, CGM Realty is going to kick ass and take names. I, I don't think you're going to be along for the ride for long. I just don't. I don't have any problem with the core and explore technique. And that is, again, the core is basic. You're taking about 80% of your portfolio, throwing in some index funds and being done with it. And explore, you're taking 20% of your portfolio and you're following your gut. Whatever your gut says, you're going with that. I, I don't have a problem with that. At the end of the day, is it worth it? Probably not. But I, I don't fault you for going that route. I do fault you if you go 20% in the core and 80% in the explore. That, that's just, you're just not likely to be able to hang in there. Um, the vast majority won't. Now, again, if you are different, more power to you. I just, I challenge that the vast majority of people will be able to hang in there when the markets are going like this up and down. All right. So uh, because, okay. So according to Morningstar, Star, while CGM focus was on his way to averaging roughly 18% annual over the past decade, the fund's investors were earning an average return of, 10 po of negative 10.8%, a staggering spread of nearly 30 percentage points. In dollar terms, each dollar invested in the fund at the outset and held through 2009 would have grown to $5.19. But the average investor, on the other hand, would have seen that dollar fall to 32 cents or 6% of what the fund actually earned. That is critical. And this is from Morningstar. Now, there is a study called Dalbar, and I challenge that quite a bit. And so I actually pay no, I'm not going to pay no adherence to Dalbar study. But the Morningstar stuff is similar to the Dalbar, with just a little bit more detailed investment analysis and studies. Um, this is pretty significant, my friends. If you are averaging, your fund averages 17.9%, but the average investor only averaged negative 10.8%. Not only did you not have a dollar grow to 519, but instead your dollar fell to 32 cents. That's bad news. And that is part and parcel of the issue that a lot of investors cannot hang in there for the long term when the market cycle goes up and down. Uh, much of this gap is attributed to something that's quite call, call, uh, common in the fund industry. A fund starts with a low asset base, 69 million in this case. It grows flush as investors rush after a solid track record is established. But the amazing magnitude of the spread in this case is also a result of investors finding they're not able to tolerate the ups and downs from one year to the next. And again, going back to my Dave Ramsey criticism, Dave Ramsey said the average fund, let's use Dave Ramsey in this example right here. Oh, the Morningstar, I mean, the CGM Focus Fund averaged 17.9 over the last 10 years. Thus, you can take out 10% a year and you're still adding 7.9% of your capital. That's foolhardy thing to say. That's foolhardy. That's absolutely wrong, 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 wrong. And it drives me crazy because people are falling for that. Just look at the comment section of his YouTube channel. It's bad because that's absolutely not unequivocally correct. That's not true. We see it right here with the CGM focus fund that the average investor actually net lost 10.5% on average where the fund itself made 17.9% because people are getting out when the fund's high and getting and selling when the fund's low, which is the kiss of death. And here, clearly, buying high and selling low is a surefire recipe for wealth destruction. Whether the fund you're moving in or out of is producing record-making returns or more mediocre results. So before you become captivated by a superior track record, you'll be well served to scratch the surface of those returns and try to honestly assess whether or not you're suited to the investment style. All right, so I want to talk about uh, USAGX because we talked about that was again press release uh, from business. 
again, they, they, here's Chris. Uh, now look, this guy is paid to promote the investments of the firm. He's not paid for you as an investor to make money. He's paid to promote the investments of the firm. I get that. And you as the investor should get that as well. Whether or not you make money is second. And I'm not saying he doesn't want to make money. Don't get me wrong. But I'm just saying at the end of the day, they put out these press releases as a way to encourage people to invest more money for them because they get paid more. There's just no getting around that. And that's where the conflict of interest in investing seems to be to me is that they're putting out press releases stouting or spouting off their wonderful returns. But these guys know full well those returns are not that you cannot expect those in the future. And that's again, why the leg Mason Valley trust fund with Bill Miller, who had a 15 year record of beating the S and P 500. No one else even came close. He was explicit saying it's luck. It's luck. It's luck. Do not invest in me. He's thinking that's going to happen again. And that's what this should have been happening here is that we got lucky. We rode a good wave. You know, don't invest in us. If you think it's going to happen again, because it's not. And unfortunately that's not what he said. Um, it's a significant achievement for both portfolio. Okay. We're happy and proud to have the best in the business here at USA. Uh, their standout performance over the past decade clearly illustrates USA's focus on delivering positive results over the long term. All right, well, let's see how that shook out. All right, so let's say you got 10,000, 100,000 bucks and you read that article and you invested at the beginning of 2011. All right, so now the, you fell 19.52% the following year in 2011. You fell 11.86% in 2012. You fell a whopping 51% in 2013, 8.26%, 27% in 2014, and then 26% in 2015. All right, so after reading all the stuff from Chris Claus and the USA uh, marketing groups and all these other guys, uh, you 100,000 bucks is now worth $23,000, uh, $271, 23,271. I did the math for you, so you don't need to do it. So you lost three quarters of your more than three quarters of your portfolio. D literally, do you think you're able to hang in there during that time? Now, you got to think this through, my friends, because it's critical. Do you think you were able to hang in there during that time? You had one hundred thousand dollars invested in there and it's now worth twenty three thousand. Now, the horrific mistake people are going to make is they're going to say, well, I got to get back to even so now they're going to ride it out. So now we have twenty three thousand two hundred seventy one dollars. And in 2016, the portfolio is up 46 percent. So it's times up by one point four six two six. Now we're back up to thirty four thousand bucks. 2017 is up nine point six five one point oh nine six five. Now we're back up to thirty seven thousand. So you're down two thirds after uh, that's let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven years. You're down two thirds of which two of the last seven years were up you know, over a half. But it's over half of not what you put in is over half of where you started. All right. Let's take a look at are these who runs these funds anymore. And I can almost assure you it's not the the guys that Chris Cause was talking about. Let's see. You got management on here. Let's see about the profile. Let's see profile here. In fact, worse. Who I just saw something I want to point out. All right, so profile. Who are the managers? Ah, look, he's still running the fund. Dan Denbo. I'm shocked at that actually. So good job to USA for hanging on with him. That's uh, that true. I'm 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 stunned to see that. I actually appreciate USA for doing that. They're sticking with a guy through thick and thin. Um, that's, that's uncommon in this industry, frankly. So good. I'm glad he's still there. That's, uh, that's fantastic. Um, the irony of it all is when the, when the records were made by USA, Dan Dembo had just started, I guess he's, uh, I'm not sure when he took over the fund, but he took over the fund as lead manager in September, 2008. Um, his co-managed the fund since October 2008. So, so that tells me he didn't um, run, manage the fund while Chris Claus was given the accolade. I don't know if Mark Johnson did before Denbo took over, um, but Chris Johnson, uh, Chris Claus singing the accolades of Denbo when Denbo had only been with the fund for uh, literally a year as of 2009. Eh, I don't know. I, I don't know if Mark Johnson was a, was running the fund before that or if Mark Johnson was, I, I don't know. So that's interesting. That, that would lead me to, 
wonder though. I'd want to do some more research. All right. So let's, I did see something I want to point out. Let's go back here. So remember, we have had a 50% increase in returns as of the end of 2017. <laughs> Watch. As of, oh my, look at this, my friends. The worst one year return as of April 29th, 2018. That doesn't make any sense. Worst, okay. I thought that's okay. So I got you. They're saying as of April 29th, 2018, the best one year return was 71.43. The worst one, one year return is 51.32%. No, this isn't, doesn't make any sense. Look at that. The best three year total return is 71.43. Ah, I don't get it. So I'm not sure what that means. Anyway, so I'm curious to see what it has done. So year to date is down 3.91. So basically, it's already given back. And this is as of April 29th. 2018. So it's already given back some of the gains from uh, you know, from 2017 as well. Now, I want to show you Motley Fool. This is pretty interesting. Pretty much when the market w was hammering and no one was calling up the managers of this fund. Uh, there's you know because no one wanted to talk about them. they're they're a uh, they're redhead stepchild at this point because they lost so much money for so many people. Um, is is this fun for you and? The uh, the guy, good guys, Molly Fool. They have a couple of uh, nice little charts here that I want to show you. All right, since 1980, that's the price of gold. All right, so we got uh, 375 an ounce, all the way up to 1220. Now it's about 1300 an ounce right now. This is as of 2015. All right, so then they say uh, over the past 15 years, gold's value has outperformed the S and P 500. Again, this is just the price of gold. Since 2000 has gone up 320%, where the S&P 500 has gone up 96%. So a lot of people might be inclined to say, I want to buy gold because the price of gold has gone up. And they're going to equate that to the price of a gold mutual fund, a mining fund. And you cannot make that equation. You cannot make the similarity. Buying gold bullion is not the same as buying a gold mining stock. Completely different things. I cannot tell you how many people made that mistake. But don't forget, here's the S&P 500 as of 2000 and about 11 right there, which it basically was, uh, did nothing essentially for those time. As I talked about in other videos, roughly nothing until the end of 2010. But here's gold uh, as, a, as a gold bullion was up 500%. So a pretty significant difference. Uh, since 2010, S&P has gone up and gold has gone down. So gold has given back a lot of the gains. S&P has taken back some of its losses. Now let's compare that to USAGX, the precious metals fund, all right? Uh, gold hasn't performed anywhere nearly as well as gold itself. And this is going from 2000 to 2015. Again, the fund invests in companies that mine for gold and other commodities. Gold bullion is literally a piece of coin that you have, completely different entities. So here's the S&P 500 in the red. And again, here's the gold, gold. And the gold, and then here's the blue in the precious metals fund. So, as of 2000, the end of 2011 or 10, the 10, this was up six, seven hundred percent, my friends, from 2000 to the end of 2010. This fund was up seven hundred percent. The S and P 500 was basically even. So we smoked the S and P 500. The fund did. If you would have bought that here, how many people bought it here? Not very many. Here's gold as a, as a bullion was up, what's that, 500%. So if you have the three investments, USAGX, a mutual fund, gold bullion, and the S&P 500, USAGX, the, the mutual fund smoked both. A gold as a bullion smoked the S&P 500, but it was still significantly less than where the price of gold, was, uh, the, not the gold mutual fund was, but both smoked the S&P 500. Now what happened, fast forward to the end of 2015, and the S&P 500 and gold are neck and neck. A gold fund, I should say, the precious metals mutual fund. <laughs> so, it's, so you had given all of these gains up. You lost them all. So who invested in the gold and precious metals fund here? Not very many, if anybody. Who invested in the gold and precious metals mutual fund here? A whole heck of a lot of people. Who kept that investment here when it gave up all its gains and even if you're looking at it, say you're still up 119 percent from um from when you started in 2000 no you weren't if you invested here we already talked about that 
you're actually about, you're sitting on a quarter of your hundred thousand dollar investment. That's it. That's as of 2015. That's it. You've lost 75% of your money. You have the gold bullion. You're still up 300%. And the S and P 500 now is worth just as much as your gold and precious metals mutual fund. So not very many people bought here. Many people bought here. Many people who bought there, are they still in there today? Well, they might say, I got to stick it out and ride it out. Well, folks, even after two pretty good years, uh, 2016 up 40%, 46% in 2017 up almost 10, you're still only sitting on $37,000 on a $100,000 investment. You're never going to get back to even. And that's why investing one-on-one -on -one is you got to cut your losses, cut your losses, cut your losses. Because once you get down significantly enough, you'll never come back. You'll never come back. In fact, now we're already giving back a lot of our gains that we have. And my cell phone's ringing. Sorry, guys. I think there's another. Yeah, so that's uh, that's it for these. Oh, yeah, right here. Uh, since 2007 market peak. Oh, yeah, this is what I want to show you. Again, this is at the end of 2015. Look at that. Gold, this is the, the bullion. Here's the S&P in red, and here's the gold and precious metals. The so gold and precious metals was down 58% at the end of 2015 since the 2007 market peak. Don't forget, the market peak, we still had a pretty good run up for gold for the next three years. The S&P 500 in red got hammered, but it went storming back uh, to where it uh, gave you real good positive returns since 2007. And gold itself is up 81% uh, at the end of 2015. So <laughs> what do you need to know? You don't ride a winner and hope that winner is going to commit to years like this, and the same thing is applicable to the Ken Hebner uh, CGM focus. What's the take on that? Uh, I forgot. I used to look at this fund all the time, as a matter of fact. I don't think I ever owned it. I don't see a ticker on this. Um, or else I show you. Yeah, I don't see the ticker. But anyway, so unless you're going to hold it for 10 years and you have a concentrated portfolio, and you can deal with all that blood right there. Just you can't you just can't do this. You cannot be in these kind of funds that are the best funds of their category because it won't last. The times are going to get tough and you're going to lose your shirt. So be advised as you watch these things, the best fund of the decade, the best fund of last year. You got to avoid them like a hawk unless, you know, you can tell by <laughs> By the by, death do you part that you're going to hang in that fund for many years to come. All right. Hope this helps. That's a little tutorial investing in the hot stuff. Um, again, I don't have any problem with Corn Explorer. I do have a problem with chasing numbers that have already hit and you're not willing to hold out for the long term. Don't forget, thumbs up, my friends. Thumbs up always help me. Uh, put comments below. You have any experience with some of this stuff? Buying high and selling low or buying low and selling high? I mean, I'd love to hear both sides of it for sure. And then uh, don't forget, to subscribe and hit the notification bell to be made aware of future content. We'll see you next time with Heritage Wealth Planning YouTube channel. Thanks, guys.